Welcome to the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we continue to bring you insights from some of the leading minds in all of health and fitness. I am Pete Hitzman, managing editor of BreakingMuscle.com, and hosting today's show is Shane Trotter. Every good coach and trainer considers themselves to some extent as a student of human movement, but few people can touch the level of devotion and study of David Weck, inventor of the BOSU ball and creator of Weck Method. David's diversity of athletic training and experience, coupled with his limitless curiosity and results rule mentality, have allowed him to realize concepts that are truly unique. In an industry that is often hogtied by convention, David unapologetically dares to flip the entire conversation on its head. In today's interview, you'll get to hear how he conceptualizes the optimal dose of training, how the literal and metaphorical concepts of balance run through all aspects of his training and life philosophy, how to deal with internal and external adversity, and the four immediate carryover effects of his favorite exercise on his new BOSU Elite. He also talks about what almost everybody has gotten fundamentally wrong about running technique and how his life experience has given him the ability to approach obstacles without fear. Today I have David Weck. Uh, he's the, the founder of the BOSU ball, uh, the, the creator of the Weck method. Uh, he actually has, there's a new BOSU ball. Uh, that is uh, designed to be used in the WEC method training. Uh, and uh, he's, he's done years of study uh, in, in balance and human locomotion. And uh, that's, that's where the bulk of his background is. He's, he's kind of a, an expert in biomechanics, balance, and human movement. So we're, we're excited to have uh, David WEC with us today. Uh, and uh, we're going to just jump right in. The getting to know you, these are all one-word questions. They're, they're simple. It's just kind of a, a way for us to quickly get an idea of who David Weck is before we jump into the meat. All right, so uh, on that note, steak or salmon? Steak. One rep max or VO2 max? Uh, well, uh, one rep max. Uh, gymnastics or martial arts? Martial arts. Okay. Air conditioning slash heat or the internet? Oh, gosh, internet. Put a blanket on. Yeah. Modern Family or Game of Thrones? I've only seen Modern Family. I've never even seen Game of Thrones. So uh, the the answer would probably be neither. (laughs) (laughs) I don't really watch TV these days. But, uh, you know, Modern I have laughed at Modern Family. Okay, sure. Star Wars or Star Trek? I mean, it would be Star Wars. Okay. I, and, and I never got into Star Trek, so I really don't know. Maybe Star Trek has these sort of, you know, really esoteric themes and stuff that's a little more interesting. But I know Star Wars more, and I, you know, I think that that's pretty uh, deep in and of itself. Absolutely. Bill Belichick or Pete Carroll? Well, uh, Belichick. Um, I love Pete Carroll's attitude. Um, but Belichick is the, you know, the scientist and he comes from Wesleyan university. I come from Williams college. So okay. there's a, there's a common background that I share with Bill Belichick. Sure. You like the economist approach a little bit. He was a defensive back. He was the defensive back coach for the New York giants. And as a kid in high school, I went to every single New York Giants summer practice. And so I was studying Belichick and his, you know, group for years Sure, and, and he's, the X's and O's of football is a fascinating chess match, and I invested a lot of study in the X's and O's. And with defense was my specialty. So, uh-huh. and I was a defensive back, and I called the coverages. So, I have a, a real affinity for Belichick. Okay. Okay. Uh, the greatest invention of the last one hundred years is. Uh, wow, it's. I mean. You could say one of the vaccines or vaccines as a general because, you know, now, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of people aren't dying. But then you could also say like the Internet, Uh, you know, the Internet is really this, you know, now it's all connected. And you might even say nuclear, uh, the harnessing of nuclear explosions. I mean, that who knows? But I think let's go with the Internet. Sure. Okay. Positive. Yeah. No, it's been a, it's been a hell of a hundred years, hasn't it? The next one hundred are going to be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the one place everyone should visit? Like the Grand Canyon. Well, just you know, it's on a scale that you know you got to stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon. You just got to like 
soak that in. You got to get yourself perspective. Um, that's probably, I mean, there's a lot of places and some that I consider, you know, quite important in my journey. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you just had to pick one, I'd say the Grand Canyon. You got one hour of sleep. Do you train anyway or call it and train another day? Um, I would train anyway, but I'm going to qualify that by saying, you know, I train the soft side too. I train the Taiji. I train uh, balance and reflexive training that would be very yin in the yin yang. So yin is the, is the soft and yang is the hard. So training doesn't necessarily mean one rep maximum. It doesn't mean VO2 max. So training is really your relationship with gravity itself. So that's what training is. So if you're awake and you train properly given the circumstances, like you, you're, you've only had an hour sleep, you can actually create a rejuvenating effect that's going to enhance your uh, the hours of being awake, even though you're tired. So that's how, that's what I would say training and then training is a certain mindfulness and training is about efficiency. Mm -hmm. So you, you, I think you train every day and I, I think what you want to do really is you want to get to the point where you have this unconscious competence for training such that every step is stronger and now you've created a muscle memory and a patterning where the, 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 just the simple act of movement is reinforcing that which is more efficient. Your, your idea is you give the appropriate dose at any time. You're deeply uh, connected to, uh, to where you are and what your needs are in that time. So you're giving the, uh, a scaled appropriate dose to, to wherever, uh, wherever your needs are at that moment. Well, and what I would say is absolutely, I, I, I'm a big uh, believer in a minimum optimal dosage. Sure. So what you, you don't want to add more fire to the thing when it's already hot enough. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to spill it over. Um, but then there's also the, the medicine itself. Mm -hmm. So in the case of I'm really too tired to train, well, then you're taking a different medicine than the, you know, you're not taking caffeine, you're taking something more sedative. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I know uh, Ivan Ivanov, gymnast uh, coach, he, he would say that uh, a workout should give you more than it takes out of you. Um, so certainly that depending on what you do, we can have a, a very different effect is kind of the thought process. So well, training yeah. is a way of life. We want to yeah. give the, the appropriate training for, for where we are. And that's a, that's a, a fairly yin and yeah. yang approach in itself. Well, and, and athletes walk out of my facility after 90 minutes feeling a sense of, okay, I could still move. I feel good. I feel engaged. I feel it in all the right places. But I in no way feel spent or exhausted. So that's, that's the way that I'm going to you know, send you off on your way after a session with me and you've done one rep max and you've worked uh -huh. very intensely, but it's, it's all balanced. It's all balanced. Sure. All right. We'll go to number two. Is there one life event that most shaped your life trajectory? Uh, I, what I would say is there's several. So uh -huh. if I'm allowed to answer the question in that manner, I could speak about a few. Okay. Uh, so I'll begin with one that is, Sort of outside of my conscious recollection, but I'm told about it and I can certainly relate to it. So this was, I fell asleep standing up when I was six years old and the profound experience of that, what I'll call Taiji, the, the supreme ultimate, where now you're, you're not consciously engaged in the process and you're not subconsciously engaged in with a conscious awareness of the circumstance around you but you are upright vertical while asleep so that's like this this perfect harmony of of doing all the right things to remain standing with uh, uh, just a, a perfect tune to the force mm -hmm. so in western 
thinking we have gravity, ground reaction, and we're in between. And our objective is to move really, really fast and powerfully. And like, that's what we want to do. Mm-hmm. In Chinese or, or the Orient or, you know, the Asian system of medicine and martial art, the, the, they look at gravity and ground reaction as heaven and earth. It's the same exact thing, but it's heaven and earth. And so it's man in between. And their objective is yin. Their objective is stillness. Their objective is to be at the center where you can live to be 900 years old. You don't burn the fire as hot because you're not trying to jump as high as you can or hit the guy as hard as you can. So the ultimate Chinese martial art is Tai Chi Chuan, where you yield, you neutralize, and you issue. So in a sense, the attack comes, but you're invisible because they can't find your center. They, they can't feel you because you've, yell, you've yielded and you've neutralized it. So now you can send the attacker on their way without even harming them because you're so centered. So those are the two polar opposites of mastery of gravity, ground, heaven, and earth. And I experienced that when I was six years old on the soft side, mm-hmm. which allows you to now discern the subtlest gradations of force. And so now when you can understand just that little, I mean, a fly lands on your body, ooh, sense everything in motion. If you have that level of tune with your nervous system, now when you start to apply and build that maximum strength, it gives you faster reaction time. It gives you better agility. It gives you better sensitivity to, to the engagement. It allows you to beat your opponent to the punch and then – change the angles with, with subtlety such that, you know, if you if you beat someone to the punch and then you can create that instantaneous leverage, mm-hmm. then they I can I can move a guy, provided he's not really trained, I can move a guy who outweighs me by a hundred pounds. Uh, provided it's not football. If it's football where sure. you can't yield Sure. Then, then you know I'll lose, and you know if it's just head to head, you got You can't sure. give an inch, I'll ever lose. But if I can give an inch, I'll move a guy who's a hundred pounds more than me, a lot stronger than me, because he's never going to find me. Mm-hmm. And if he does find me, I'm leveraged with bone alignment that I will not let him get to my center. So I will allow myself to be moved, but I maintain the structural integrity that he's not on my center. So that. Uh, that life event was profound. Okay. Another life event for me that was very profound was I destroyed my elbow when I was 16 years old playing football and I broke what's called the electronon process. It, okay. it snapped and I had a suburban New Jersey surgeon who, you know, there was no internet back then and he didn't know what he was doing and I didn't know that he didn't know and he performed two operations that botched my arm. I lost I lost my triceps. I can't straighten the arm out. Okay. And I was told I'd never play football again. I literally in high school, I couldn't hold my arm above my head. I mean, I put it up in here and the only way I played football was like I taped the structure so it couldn't be bent, right? So I could, uh-huh. you know, use it but I couldn't bend it because the mechanics of tape so tight. So what that did was that um, gave me a um, something to sort of organize my perseverance and never say quit and I will die trying attitude mm-hmm. around that uh, weakness or deficiency, uh, the injury, the broken wing. And so it was just a it was a model for for overcoming challenge. Because my greatest passion was athletics, and now I don't have a right arm. I mean, it was you know, it was a huge deal. Um, so that's that's sort of um, a huge life event that really shaped me. Sure. And then uh, what I would say is um, sort of the highs and lows um, emotionally, psychologically. I've gone on you know manic runs where I've discovered things that I would not have discovered if I had not been way out there and then I've been extremely low um, where you know catatonic low and um, that process several oscillations of that process spit me out on the other end here uh, with a profound understanding of stability Mm -hmm. so now now you can't hurt me Mm -hmm. because I have truly nothing to hide I'm I'm probably the most transparent person that you'll ever meet. And if you ask me a question, be careful because you're going to get an answer. Uh-huh. You know, I'm not 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend. So I don't have the same social, uh, corralled, uh, situation where, you know, you, you, you're not, you're, you're never going to let them see you sweat and, you know, you're not going to reveal any of the weaknesses. I truly don't care. So those are some profound life events that have truly shaped me. To, to, to tease into those second cup or the second and third, uh, yes. I think there's just something very, very powerful about its struggle that tends to make us grow the most. But when we look back at our lives, it's almost always those those moments of deep struggle, of of, of challenge, of of an unexpected obstacle, of unfairness. You know, if you want to look through the lens of most people, you know, they, they would just look at it as this isn't fair. And it's those moments that create our greatest selves. To, to, to be at a point where you don't care what people think, that, that's kind of a beautiful thing. To, to be at a point where you can be as truly you and as honest as humanly possible is a phenomenal place to be and, and, and quite empowering, I imagine. I think that, that that's what I get over and over again, and I think it's worth highlighting that it's, it's through these unexpected challenges, what you perceive as unfair, that it truly becomes your greatest gift. Um, if you're willing to see it that way. Yeah, my football coach who had a profound, uh, in college, my football coach had a profound impact on me um, in many ways. And he would say, and we were a winning team. I mean, we lost twice in four years, and one of those losses was unfair. Like, it was a bad call that, you know, is the reason we lost. And what he would say is, men... You're going to learn who you are when you lose. Win, and he would say winning is easy. So you work real hard to win, and it's not easy in that sense. But once you've won, that's easy. Mm-hmm. It's, when, it's when you lose, that's when you learn. And if you think about sort of a human being coming into this world, you have, want, you have needs, okay? You have needs that, that transform into wants when you're an infant, and your needs are met by others around you. So you cry and you're fed or you're cleaned. And that's sort of the communication, right? You have a problem, you cry. And then somebody comes and tries to fix that problem. Yeah. And as, as the needs transform into wants, if every want were acquired and granted, then the want curve would be ever expanding. So, and it would have no limit. So if I want and I receive, well then I want and I receive and I want and I receive and I want and I receive. And eventually you would want it all. And if you got it all, you'd take it all. But now what happens is you have to reconcile the fact that what you want, you don't get. And so now that begins to really shape you. And it's how you respond to the rejection or the loss or the failure That's going to determine, can you figure out a way to get over the wall or to fundamentally change your want structure so that you're no longer fighting for that particular thing? And there's a great wisdom in that because if you react by changing that which you want but you don't really change that which you want, then it becomes something that burdens you and something that holds you back. Mm-hmm. So navigating that is the job of everybody, and it's all subconscious. You're not thinking about it, but that's the reality. So it's it's the resistance that makes it interesting and that makes you grow in unexpected ways, and it leads to new opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have presented themselves and manifest like this broken arm. Sure. Had, had I broken this arm, maybe I don't invent the BOSU ball. Maybe I don't understand locomotion like anybody else on this planet. Maybe I'm not in a position to literally transform the way that the world walks, runs, and sprints because that's what's happening right now. And it's the, it's the, it's the challenges that shape that. Absolutely. You have to choose only one exercise for life. What is it and why? And I have a feeling I know what you're going to choose. Okay, well, it, without question, it is a compression swing with the BOSU Elite. And I can explain exactly what that is. Okay. So the BOSU Elite is a firm BOSU ball. Uh-huh. So 
It provides a pressurized elastic resistance with a three-dimensional shape that engages the musculature of the body when you compress it with very precise specificity that engages the, the fibers of the biggest muscles with a more force, faster stimulus. And because of the three-dimensional shape, and when you know how to do the setup and set the, the musculature in alignment with the skeleton, you create an engagement of the adductors, the glutes, and the upper hamstrings unlike anything else. And it's the adductors that are really the key in this equation that gives you that glute upper hamstring engagement. And it's because for the only way that you're going to get skeletal transmission of force through the bottom of the feet with this pressurized elastic resistance that's a, it's a dynamic isometric. So it's not a stalemate. It's a micro give and take. And the more you give, the more you get that's cueing your nervous system to go against this pressurized elasticity to fire more force faster with skeletal transmission. So any other way that you engage and train the adductors to target them is with an oblique force from the side. And that's why we think of adductors as adductors. Sure. But what you want, what we want to do is you want to think of the adductors differently and you want to train the adductors differently. You want to think of them as flexors and extensors and you want to target and train them as flexors and extensors. And the only way to do that effectively is force transmission through the bottom of the feet. So this compression is what sets up the, the unique stimulus and the directional forces that serve you very specifically. And the weight that you're swinging just provides this this ballistic power loading. So you're compressing the whole time. You send the weight up, it weighs zero. You bring it down to the bottom and it weighs its maximum. Sure. And you create a deeper, more intense fire in the glutes than anything else on this planet. I stopped the exercise because the fire in my glutes is so hot. It's not because I ran out of the metabolics to complete more repetitions. It's a, I get off because I can't take the intensity of, of what's happening in the glutes. And so the result of this specific setup and training exercise yields four carryover effects immediately. When you step off the BOSU ball, your feet feel lighter. It is a distinct feeling that I achieve with every single person, every single set, every single time. If we don't get it, you didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Feet feel lighter because now the adductors are flexing and extensing like they've never done before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second thing is your glutes are engaged on every single step. You have this proximal posterior power that's transmitting to and from the ground in a way that it's never done before. It's a more complete connection. So you have this proximal connection. And third is balance on the balls of your feet feels easy. So now you are moving around with that athletic leverage where you have the power of the heel because you're connected to the posterior, mm -hmm. balanced through the balls of the feet. So it's profound. Fourth factor immediate carryover is you can perform a better squat movement. And this is why the CrossFitters who are discovering this fall in love with it. This is why the CrossFitter who never even thought of a BOSU ball is now using it personally every single workout and has six of them in the facility so there's not a bottleneck so that everybody can prime for that squat, in particular the overhead squat. Because of the engagement of the glutes and upper hamstrings and the adductor effect where you can now pull yourself into a better squat position. You can position the center of gravity or center of mass slightly forward within the base and still capture all of that posterior, which means you can create a better skeletal wedge under the bar.
which means you lift more and it means it's safer. So that's the compression strength training with the, you can either swing a kettlebell or a dumbbell, it's just resistance. That's the number one exercise on planet Earth if you want the best in athletics with an immediate carryover effect that just gets better and better and better the more your nervous system and structural soft tissue gets acclimated and trained in this manner. So it's, it never diminishes. You will always get that effect and the effect gets more acute and more tuned the more you do it. And it also gives you an aesthetic effect unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. Because you're 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 burning the calories, you're you're metabolic. Metabolic, yeah. Fifteen seconds off you get when you get off the BOSU ball. You get off because the burn is intense, and fifteen seconds later the metabolics hit you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I just did work and I gotta recover metabolically. Okay, so that's the number one exercise on planet Earth. For anybody, and so that's my exercise, right? And that's what's new about Bosu training. I invented the Bosu ball 17 years ago, and I just reinvented the Bosu ball essentially October 2016. And I had explored compression training, but I hadn't, I hadn't fully figured it out in terms of the specifics of how you load it and that 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 specificity and precision. Mm -hmm. which is easy to do once you know it, mm -hmm. but that right there, and then I just eliminated all the rest, like a diamond in a haystack, who cares if you can't find it, and there's a bunch of hay all around, and you're distracted mm -hmm. from the diamond, so what, what I did essentially with this exercise is I just removed all the hay, there is no reason to squat on a BOSU ball any other way than compression and strength training, I mean, if if you figure out how to maximize and optimize the utility, why would you ever do something that provided less utility, right? Yes, so now, let me just, and I know this is a long answer, but it's just, it's so extraordinary because the better you get at it, the better you move on the ground and the better it primes you to lift heavier weights and the better you get metabolics. So, I mean, it's a three for one that's unlike anything else. Now, you can compress the Bosa Elite through the hands as well. And what that does is it creates a center line strength. So left to its own devices, structurally, the body wants to do this. The body wants to press to the center line and then expand out once it gets beyond that centralized point. Sure. Then it wants to do this. And this is why a bench presser will bend and break the bar. It's because it engages the lats and you've come to this position here. The issue is nobody knows this, so they just come up and they start the process here. But the reality is if you want to optimize it, the process starts before the process starts. And so when you learn how to compress into that dome and you're learning how to fire more force faster, which is the key, that's the key to unlocking new strength and new power, you get this here, now when you set up under the bar, you're packed that much tighter. And your nervous system knows that, that I know how to fire force faster. Think of a slingshot, it, it's faster than gravity. This is pressurized elastic resistance. And up at Cal Poly, where you have you know two strength coaches with incredible foresight, Chris Holder and Chris White, they, teach this, these specific techniques to their athletes. They're the first strength and conditioning program to do it. Arizona Cardinals have just incorporated as well. Buddy but, Morris. And, and it's going to be a necessity. But you have Pro Day. And Pro Day is the most important day of a 22-year-old's life, right? You're either going to go to the NFL or you're not. And that's a massive fork in the road. You talk about dealing with you know, University. deal with something. If you don't make it, now you got to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to do everything in your power and you're going to leave nothing on the table. And so what do they do when they have the bench press test? They start out with three reps of compression training. That's what they start with. Then they come to a 275-pound bar and press it once. And then they go under the 225 and they get between four and two extra reps that they would not have gotten otherwise. So that's how powerful this compression strength training is, and it's unlike anything else. 
And like I said, it took me 17 years to discover it. And so the Bozu ball, which was always a product that provided tremendous, and it provides tremendous utility, versatility, and a training stimulus unlike anything else, that's fundamentally misunderstood by the guys who want to get strong. And here's what it is. It provides a stable, unstable environment that allows the nervous system to to no longer have to deal with that threat response. When you're on that BOSU ball, you can load it ballistically with this three-dimensional shape that enhances your ability to, to pattern ground loading from lateral strength, fourth and fifth metatarsal, across medial and out big toe. So just the structure of it when you load it ballistically gives you that just, it does. And you strengthen the feet and the ankles and the lower shank unlike anything else. You develop a relationship of center over base and your nervous system learns how to drop the tension. And dropping the tension is the key to getting the first step, the jump, the agility, and that athletic, so that you're not tense up top. Sure, and more the, receptive and, and flow. And, and so the person who really their primary objective is to lift as heavy weight as possible and they care less about moving, that, that's the person who doesn't like the BOSU ball right now. Mm-hmm. But not, the athletes, they find a place for it because it's, it's beneficial to move it. Now, the new BOSU ball with the new compression strength training and the new coiling core exercise, which I'm going to get into later, gives the strong people something that serves their interests better. You will be stronger with a barbell if you do compression strength training with a BOSU elite. That's just – that's a fact. And so – if it makes you better what you want to do, well, even if you don't like it, you sort of have no choice because advantages become necessities sure. in the competitive world. So You talked about that in your head on your, your new running yes. presentation. Head, head, that head, head, the, the results are going to dictate that we do things a different way. The result rules. And the cold, harsh reality of life itself is that the inputs are insignificant in the end, which means – all the effort, all the trying, all the caring, all the da 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 da, which is essential, doesn't add up to anything if you don't get the result. Absolutely. And, I mean, and take it back to survival. If you don't catch the deer, your family doesn't eat and you all die. If you do, you make it through the winter, okay? It's that cold and harsh results rule. And the competitive environment that we live in. Who won second place in the hundred meter dash? You 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 Never tell happened. me, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what the real answer is? Who cares? That's that's the re- that's the real answer. Yeah. Unless you're in the community, you don't care who won second place because you care who won first place and what they're doing. Amen. And the guy who won second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth—they're all doing head over foot. Because you can't be in that you can't be in sure. that 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 echelon without. But you yeah. watch the New York City, you watch the New York City Marathon, and you got a, a mass of people all running inefficiently, and every single resource that they can get their hands on, eyeballs on, coached or whatever, is telling them to do something that is not efficient, which is brace your core and keep your head nice and still so that you can transmit the forces from your hips through your body to the shoulders to counterbalance, it's fundamentally wrong. So there's, if you comb the internet, there's like two, two resources of people that I've ever seen, the three resources that I've ever seen, there's probably a few more, but they're not well known. And they're the ones who are teaching you that, yes, in fact, you want the lateral movement. You want the lateral movement. And what I've done is I've, identified it with a specific and simplified cue to actualize it, and I've created an entire training methodology underneath that. So what I've done is I've given you exactly what to do, and then I've given you the best and how to train to do it better. So light years ahead of the the experts and in accord with the 
you know, with the person who studied Feldenkrais, who also knows the, the reality of the mechanics, the biomechanics of running efficiency, or the person who studied with, you know, Ida Rolf and structural integration, who knows the reality. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that subtle background in terms of biomechanics and neurological understanding, and you're just relying on sort of the Western model and you're listening to those experts, well, you've never been presented with accurate information. Sure. And, and, that, now and that's the lights most are, people in the coaching the lights, industry. Now the lights are on and results rule. So if you're the 40-year coach who's got 100 Olympians under your belt and you gave a lecture last week, well, guess what? You presented inaccurate information. Mm -hmm. Time to change. Otherwise, you get left behind. That's and, and there's no choice. You can't be left behind. Mm -hmm. That would be career suicide not to change. Try and, try and do the high jump the way they used to do it and see how many sure. athletes are sure. following. Everyone's Fosbury flopping. Yeah. Yeah. And the word flop is a derogatory uh, name to begin with because it was vehemently opposed. It was ridiculed, vehemently opposed, and, uh, you know, not accepted for a long, long time when it first came out. It took 10 years to adopt it. So Absolutely. That, yes. Well, boy. Gosh, th that was a heck of a response to uh, the the one exercise, but uh, brilliant, yeah. beautiful. Uh, in that, I mean, you really got down to the essential. Why it's essential? Why why you scrape away everything that's unessential and do the most effective one thing? Uh, what is the one training or nutrition myth you'd eliminate from the face of the earth forevermore? Um, well, here's, here's, a, I'll, I'll sort of speak to several things and then some of the things that I think are false understandings that lead to, um, sort of an incorrect foundation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first one I'll talk about is deep squatting. Okay. okay. So there, there's this common head, common held belief that, you know, you need to be able to deep squat to be complete as someone who can move well. And the reality is, is that there, there's a, a huge percentage of population who anatomically, skeletally, cannot deep squat. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you were to say LeBron James, you know, you need to do a deep squat. You need to put your butt on the ground. Your back needs to be perfect, um, and you need to hold the bar overhead. You know, you, and you need that. Otherwise, you know, you don't have good movement. Well, he'll fail the test. Okay, Michael Jordan failed the test. You've seen Bolta fail the test. There's a whole slew of incredible athletic people who tend to be good runners and jumpers who will never do a deep squat. Okay, sure. if you're born in Asia and you're you know five foot nine and you, you know your parents can deep squat and your their your grandparents can do it, odds are you're going to be able to do it really really well. So that's um, that's one of the things that it's, it's just a common misunderstanding. And it doesn't mean that you don't want to, uh, you know, do the best squat that you can do. But if that is a standard and you'll never run well, uh, you know, if, if you don't do that, well, now you're operating on a false premise. And that false premise stems from the fact that people tend to think that, you know, infants move perfectly. Oh, they, you know, they, they move absolutely perfectly. They all deep squat perfectly. Well, no, they don't. I can show you. I can show you 500 pictures of kids with a massive butt wink that you'd never want to load as an adult, <laughs> and they're they're babies and they're not doing it well. And the proportion of their bodies is advantageous to do it better than an adult because the head is one third the size of the entire body and the length of the femur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So. Again, it's a misunderstanding at the fundamental level that babies and small children squat perfectly and run perfectly because a large percentage of them do not, okay? And the influence in terms of learning starts genetically, okay? You come into this world a certain way genetically, mm -hmm. and then the environment around you shapes you. Yes. And if, if you come into this world genetically not capable of doing a fantastic deep squat and everybody around you is walking inefficiently and running inefficiently mm -hmm. and, speaking, and speaking English, well, then odds are you're going to speak English. That's just the I don't think you're going to be speaking Chinese if everybody around you is speaking English, right? Yeah. And it's osmosis. It's yeah. happening without conscious awareness. And – you're going to pattern their movement behavior. And again, it's, you know, if you're born in Kenya, 
where you don't really do the best deep squats because you're runners, but everybody around you runs really, really well, well, then the odds are that's the movement behavior that you're going to pattern by osmosis. So you have this fundamental misunderstanding amongst, and I'm talking experts, I'm talking about the people we go to for our information telling us that, you know, in order to run right, you have to perform a perfect deep squat. Well, no, you don't. And perhaps you can't. And if you were to do it, you would have to crack your bones to do it, right? The, the hip socket, we'd have to dislocate it so that you could get into that perfect slot. So those are the things that I would eliminate is the misunderstanding at the fundamental level. Because I'm a guy who believes in fundamentals and the foundation. And when you can solidify that, everything gets better by proxy. So it's, it's, it's not about fixing the topical thing necessarily is, is you fix the foundation and now organically everything else will flourish you to a great trying extent. to fit the square peg in the round hole because you get to understanding what, oh, oh that doesn't fit here. That idea sure, doesn't correct. fit. Sure. Sure. Correct. That's correct. What is w one habit or ritual that you most credit uh, with success in life? I mean, I think it, it relates back to this dealing with failure. I mean, I think the one habit or ritual is is get up and, you know, go back at it. So I think that that's the fundamental because everybody has sort of, you know, a different ritual or I need X number of hours of sleep or, you know, I need to keep my desk organized. I keep it messy, whatever it is. But the one quality I think is, you know, when met with adversity, you figure out how to, you know, keep going. I think that's your biggest uh answer to success a tenacious or dogged spirit of some sort is is really yeah. the, the most important quality uh, for i think success. So. i think so. yeah i like that i like that a lot you can only read one book what is it and why I'm trying to think of the wow that's a <clears throat> that's a difficult question um one book only one book I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, I'll answer it in a very sort of oblique, well, in a, in a different tack, okay? The, the one book that you should read is your book, the story of your life, okay? So, and what you should do is you should, you should write it in a way that, that you know, you, you should read yesterday's passage, Right. So you should look back and see what the story was yesterday, yesterday, meaning, you know, the years before, and then see how you want today's page to unfold and then project forward how you want the story to be told. So that's the book that you should read. I like it. It's thought provoking. That's one to, one to think on. You have only one lesson you can impart on the next generation. All will mm -hmm. adhere 100 percent to this advice. They will absolutely ignore any subsequent suggestions or advice. What lesson do you communicate? Every step stronger. <laughs> let's let's fundamentally educate you physically and make every single step that you take biomechanically optimized. All right, that because that's my contribution. Now, sure. I mean, you know, love your neighbor as thyself, and all those type of things. Maybe that's even more profound, but. The one that I, my life's mission is the every step stronger. So I'll let somebody else, sure. you know, for, for you the, as the this, teacher, that's your lesson to teach. And, that's my lesson. And, yeah. and it's a great metaphor for life in general. <laughs> what, it, what it does, what it does, is it's going to give you a fundamental. If you look at it from the Asian perspective, it's a better relationship between heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Gravity ground is Western, heaven and earth is Asian or, or Eastern, and they're the same exact thing. Absolutely. All right, the last one. If you could create one rite of passage for all our society, what would it be? Uh, wow, these are really profound questions that, you know, and, and I think it, it's really interesting because you'd answer these questions differently at different stages in your life. Um, Certainly. One rite of passage. One rite of passage. Um, wow. Let me let me let me collect myself so that okay. I can throw the throw the so ball back. Yeah, that one's tough to just take. I, I I would need a lot of prep for that. I know. Okay. That. So so okay. So so one rite of passage that I think everybody should do. 
I, I, what, what's coming to my mind right now is that that one rite of passage should be that everybody stands up in front of a group of people and affects, effectively speaks to the group, which means that you may fail the first time. You may be so nervous that you can't do a good job, but a rite of passage would be that you stand up in front of a group of people and you effectively deliver whatever it is you have to say. Okay? They say that the number one fear is public speaking. That's a great thought, yeah. So let's make that a rite of passage where you have you have persevered confidently or not confidently, but you've persevered to do it successfully. The outcome, the result, regardless of how you felt when you did it, that should be a rite of passage. I love that. Everybody should do that. Yeah, I love that. You know, rites of passage should be feel fear. You should you should have to overcome. Uh, yeah. uh, and, yeah. A, a, a significant block. Plus, I think speaking, writing, all all of them have this deep power in, in allowing us to, to understand ourselves a lot better through the process. I don't think you can speak well if you don't know yourself well or don't know what it is that you're really trying to communicate to the world. So I that's think, the, you got you got to know what it is you want to say. Exactly. I think I think with the right topic, uh, that that could be a very powerful uh, process. I really like that. Such a treat to get to sit down. I mean, you, you are unbelievable, uh, and, and I could I could listen and learn all day. So I really appreciate you taking the time. All right, great. And and I I, I want a copy of this, and I want to see it where you know when it airs. Yes, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Take care of that. Thanks so right. much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Like I said, great questions. I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you. Awesome. Well, you have a great day. And we'll be in touch.